Um, we have a few minutes now, um, and um, I, I guess let's let's take um, just under 15 minutes for a few questions to kick off our discussions, and we can continue talking about these issues over the reception and, and tomorrow as well. Uh, so let's start um, on the left here in the in the middle. Uh, speakers, uh, where is this uh, systematic and also you, your uh, presentation complementary with each other? Uh, I would like to uh, ask uh, Justine to elaborate more about the question that uh, 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 in the transitional economy, there is uh, no uh, well functioned competitive market. Then uh, is government the first mover, or does government give the first push for uh, to for the structure adjustment? If so, uh, when would be a turning point for government to withdraw? Uh, because too strong government would prevent development of a well competitive market. And how, since if government too strong, there would for, uh, form an uh, interest group that they would not like to be withdrawn. And second, uh, where's the position for your framework of the environment and the social policy? for uh, structure adjustment, get out of middle income trap. Thank you. Uh, your case is very clear that, that endowment structure matters and that countries seeking to catch up can't be that far away back and they should choose industries proximate to their endowments in some sense. In my case, I believe it's the only thing that may not connect it with the Kanami Akamatsu's flying gears model is that uh, there's no regional investment trade synergies. But how would you say take an argument that actually comes from uh, the perspective of Weblin and, uh, and Gershenkron? They make the point that the further the country is, the further the firms are from, say, the incumbent, the, the faster and quicker they will catch up. And that's, that's an argument that has lots of uh, evidence to, to support. Um, uh, Samsung Semiconductor may be a good example as one, where there's an attempt to actually shortcut the process of catching up by acquiring firms, uh, the way Samsung went up, and today it's the firm that shapes the memory, memory market. Then, say, Logic Chips in, in Taiwan, uh, Taiwan Semiconductor Manufacturing Corporation. This seems to take a different line of thinking, though. Uh, I'm not saying this is the perspective to follow, but there are so many examples, both from Korea and Taiwan. I'd, I'd just like to see your response. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I think we have a question here from David Malone. Thank you. Uh, it's more of a comment, uh, but I'd be delighted to have a response, because I'm usually wrong. Uh, one thing that it seems to me tends to precede uh, the type of development that uh, Justin was uh, describing so eloquently uh, uh, in countries that have experienced starvation or serious famine, usually trying to put the agriculture of the country in order is something that people in government really want to do. It's what they owe their country most, probably. And so in India and perhaps in Deng Xiaoping's China, the first order of business was to try to make the country more self-sufficient in agriculture uh, such that it could uh, feed itself in extremity. And then other things become possible if only because you have confidence that those basics are uh, being met. Obviously, in very small countries, in countries that are uh, desertified and so on, that's not possible. But in large countries, uh, being able to feed the population is a pretty basic uh, desire of most populations and most governments. 
Uh, it wasn't your topic, but I thought it might be worth mentioning. In um, transformation that is closely related to structure, um, structural transformation, which is urbanization. And um, increasingly, I think economists see urbanization, at, which has a distinct feature from structural transformation on geography and space related. And some people see it as an engine for growth um, because it um, um, encourages um, in using increasing return to scale and reducing um, um, transaction cost. So I want to see um, Professor Lin's view about um, urbanization versus structural transformation and how do you see this? Um, Julian's question about you know, when the government is too strong and uh, how to withdraw from the you know, market. And my position is that it may not be the good way to see the issue because in my framework, the government need to play some role. It's not to withdraw because if you want to have a dynamic economic growth, you need to have market and you also need to have the state to facilitate the structural transformation. And uh, I think that you have the case of China in mind. The Chinese government seems to be very strong. But I think that it is a result of China adopted a dual track approach to transition. Because China started with a planning economy with a huge sectors, which when China has comparative advantages. If China followed the Washington consensus to exit from the intervention, then the result will be something like Russian or Eastern European country. That is the collapse of the whole system, instability, and so on. Then you could not have the economic growth. China adopted a dual track approach. On the one hand, continue to provide necessary transitory protection and subsidy to all sectors and to maintain stability. But at the same time, proactively to facilitate to entry to the new sectors, which are consistent with China's competitive advantages. And by that, China could have a stability and dynamic economic growth. But certainly, now China reached a stage. Because many of the sectors which used to win against China's competitive advantages, like a car, like equipment. But China now is a high middle income country. And uh, those sectors become China's competitive advantages. And, uh, the you know, subsidy and protection should be removed. Then under this kind of situation, whether Chinese government has the ability to do that? It's because of West interest group there, China won't be able to do that. For that, I think any government has certain kind of discretionary power. And if they are convicted, if they are convinced, removing all those kind of distortion or subsidy would be good, then the government should have the ability to do that. Because if you look back 30 years ago, there was vested interest group of there, there also, like the agriculture, like the commune, or even the health industries at the time, they also had a lot of vested interest group there. But Chinese government was able to do that at the time, and that means that the government is not necessarily a hostage of vested interest group you know, power capture. So I think that one of very important condition for any country is how the government to use those kind of discretionary power to facilitate the growth of the new sectors and to remove the distortion in the old sectors when it's ready. That's the first one. And the second one is regarding the Gershon Kron in a position, the further away from your technology or industrial frontier, and it seems to be you know, you can have a faster rate of catching up. And I think Gershon Krong studies the late 19th century and early 20th century. And certainly we found, like you know, France and Germany were closer to uh, 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 Britain, and then Hungary, Poland, and Russia were, were far away from the, uh, 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 Britain. And the Gershon Krong's prediction was that you know, if you are far away from the frontier, then the government need to have more interventions and to build up those kind of industries. Yes, 
And the results show that, yes, with the government stronger intervention, you were able to build up those kind of industry. But that kind of industry still went against your comparative advantages. So they are not viable, and they were not successful. So my position is somewhat a revision from the Gershon Kron position. You need to be modest. Just like in the late 19th century, when Germany, France, and the US wanted to catch up the, the, the Britain, the government had some facilitation, but the government did not have a strong intervention, and they were successful. It's because following my principle, their per capita income was not far away from UK's per capita income because in the late 19th century, the per capita income in Germany was about 60% of UK's per capita income. And uh, France and also France is also about 60%. But US was already 75%. So with a little bit of intervention, they were successful in catching up. But other, like in Hungary or in Russia, in Poland, they were able to build up the industry, but they were not competitive. So that is a change in my position. Then coming to the agriculture, certainly we come into the low-income country. 75%, 80% of the population live on agriculture. And so to support the development of agriculture, we have the largest effect on poverty reduction. But you also need to have structural changes in agriculture, in terms of technology, in terms of Change, it, change it from subsistence agriculture to you know, market-oriented commercial agriculture. For that, the government needs to play the facilitation role, both. But on the other hand, only agriculture would not enough. If you wanted to have a sustained increase in the income, then you need to have a structural transformation from agriculture to the industrial sectors, and the government needs to play facilitation role. So I agree, should not forget agriculture but to support agriculture, structural transformation in agriculture itself and the whole economy would be desirable. Then, coming to uh, urbanization. I think that in the process of economic development, urbanization certainly should be one very important dimension of structural transformation. Because all the low-income countries started with agrarian economy, very wide spray, very thin in the urbanization. But when you move to the industrial sectors and the service sectors, they all have much larger economic scale and they were concentrated in the cities. And so I would say urbanization should be treated as a spontaneous process of the structural transformation. And in this structural transformation, certainly the government should play some kind of facilitation role. However, you cannot also use you know, to, to promote the urbanization without the development in the industrial sector and so on. If you did that, then the result will be a lot of unemployment and urban gators, as we observe in Latin America and also, also to some extent also in African countries. So it should be considered as an organic process of the structural transformation. In this process, certainly, the government has some role to play. Well, uh, there's a Cameroonian proverb that says, when you speak in public, you should feel pity for those who are listening to you. Uh, since there was no specific question directed to me, I think we should just go have a glass of wine. Huh? <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> well, thank you very much to our, our two speakers and our, our discussant. Um, I know there are a number of other questions and comments in the audience, and I invite all of you to continue the discussion over drinks and dinner starting at 6.30 uh, in the, where is it, in the Lakeside Garden Terrace and Chime Bar, which is downstairs. Uh, and so on that note, let me close this session, and thank you all for being here. <laughs>